Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maggie Winger. I supervise the Rules Unit at the Pollution Control Agency. Thank you for joining us for the third in our series of co-learning webinars about the cumulative impacts rule. Um, we're really happy to have two people joining us today to share their expertise in this area and to give you a chance to ask them questions about how cumulative impacts work in their areas. Um, as many of you have heard, we are, you know, still sort of at the beginning of a long rulemaking process to, to bring last year's cumulative impacts law into fruition at the agency, and we really appreciate all the time you've put into engagement and that there will be many more opportunities to come. Um, today, we're really going to hear about the contents of cumulative impact analyses, what goes into those, what kind of information, what we get out at the end. Um, and we're going to have a lot of time to both hear from the two speakers and to, for you to ask them all questions. Um, we really appreciate your participation, and I'm going to hand it off to Dion Consulting to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Maggie. Um, we are, yeah, we have two speakers with us today, um, and I'm going to uh, introduce both of them here, and then we will have them speak for about 20 minutes, and we want to leave about 10 minutes for questions and answers. Um, the questions that we will be taking will be the ones that you have for our two speakers. We understand that there's they will there will be comments that you may have and questions that you have that you want to get across to MPCA today, and we will accept those and we will we're logging them all and they will be um, taken back by the MPCA team. Uh, but the questions that we'll address today will be the ones that are are directed to their speakers. So uh, first, we're going to hear from Karen McGowan. And Karen was appointed to the Energy and Carbon Management Conservation Commission by Colorado's Governor Polis in 2020. And she's serving in the capacity of a member with formal training or substantial experience in public health. Ms. McGowan spent over a decade at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment as the Deputy Executive Director and the Director of Community Relations. During her tenure there, she worked on public health and environmental policies regarding oil and gas activities. Previously, she worked at the Denver Regional Council of Governments as the Director of Policy Development and Communications. She also served as Assistant Director for External Affairs with Great Outdoors Colorado and in various policy and legislative capacities under Governor Roy Romer. She's got a bachelor's from the University of Wisconsin in Madison and a master's of public affairs from Indiana University uh, Bloomington. <clears throat> and so today we're going to hear from Karen um, about what they're doing in Colorado to address cum cumulative impacts. Our second speaker, I think I'll introduce um, when we get when we get through the Q and A. So we're pulling up um, Ms. McGowan's slides here. And we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me today. Um, like Anna said, I am a commissioner on the, we're now called the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. We used to be called the uh, uh, Colorado Oil and Gas Commission. Um, we've added other uh, energy sources to our portfolio. So now we're the Energy and Carbon Management Commission. But thanks for inviting me, and I hope um, some things that I can share as part of our experience will be helpful for you all as you uh, start your journey or continue your journey to figuring out and how to address cumulative impacts. Next slide, please. So um, in Colorado, two important pieces of legislation that have kind of driven what we're doing at the commission. One was Senate Bill 181, uh, passed in 2019 which changed um, the commission from one that fosters oil and gas development to one that is supposed to protect uh, um, public health, safety, welfare, and the environment and wildlife resources as we look at how we develop oil and gas in Colorado. And embedded in that bill was the direction to the commission to, in consultation with the Department of Public Health and Environment, evaluate and address the potential cumulative impacts of oil and gas. Then uh, last year, sorry, can you, thank you. Last year, um, the legislature said, we, we really want you to dig in a little bit more to cumulative impacts because we didn't, we didn't address defining cumulative impacts um, as you'll see later in the presentation. 
We just embedded the ideas and principles of cumulative impacts into our rulemaking. And the legislature said, we really want you to come up with a definition for it. And so that's what we're working on right now um, as part two of our cumulative impacts rulemaking. Next slide, please. So um, what I like to share with folks when they ask us, how did how is 181 working? This is um, information about the number of locations that have been approved by the commission before the change to protecting the environment, public health, safety, welfare, and wildlife to um, comparing it to after those rules passed. Um, so there's two ways that things are approved by the commission. One is the location where the oil and gas development will happen, and then the number of wells that are on each location. So you can see that before 181, um, more than a thousand locations were approved by the commission and more than 10,000 wells to be drilled. After Senate Bill 181 uh, to date, 149 locations have been approved and uh, just under 3,000 wells. Next slide, please. Um, if you're a visual person like I am, this is what the chart looks like. Next slide. Um, so there are different ways that Senate Bill 181 and the way that we change the rules try to tackle and get at uh, cumulative impacts. One is the rulemaking itself, and I'll explain some of the things that were put into the rules. Um, so overall, the way that the rules have been set up have um, resulted in fewer permits being applied for and permits that are of what I would argue are higher quality and more protective. Then within the rules, we're requiring things of operators as part of individual location assessments by the commission and then an annual review of all the data of all the things that we've been approving to see if we can use that data to inform what we do as a commission and how we make decisions. Next slide, please. Uh, so in the rules themselves, there are, um, we have more than 1200 series of rules. Uh, so I don't know how many you all have, but we've got a lot over at the commission. And we looked at all those rule series and said, where do we need to make changes to make um, what we do more protective. And some of the most important changes that we made um, following the hierarchy of avoiding, minimizing, or mitigating the impacts from oil and gas development are requiring alternative location analysis when an oil and gas development is near sensitive receptors, and in particular, people and sensitive wildlife habitat. Requiring 2,000 foot setbacks from uh, residents, schools, um, high occupancy building units, for example, protecting high, uh, high priority habitat for wildlife, requiring more robust community engagement when a development is near and or within a community, especially disproportionately impacted community. There's a longer time frame for public uh, input and feedback and required community engagement meetings from the uh, for the operator. And then we've also now embedded into our process consultation and collaboration with our sister agencies, public health uh, and environment and uh, uh, wildlife, the Department of Wildlife. And then local governments are the first step in our consultation process. They get a first bite of the apple and tell us what they would like to see in an oil and gas development application. Next slide, please. So for the CDPHE consultation, um, things that trigger a consultation where we'd like to see what CDPHE is thinking is when there are health and environmental considerations. So for example, there are some instances where an operator can develop closer than a 2000 foot step back. Those instances are when the people who live closer than 2000 feet sign informed consent, or if an operator can show by using some best management practice strategies that they can be substantially as protective as if they were 2,000 feet away. So in those instances, we kind of want to know what CDPHE is thinking about the emissions and the potential impact on the people living within 2,000 feet. Uh, if their location is in within a disproportionately impacted community, that triggers CDPHE consultation. And if there's air quality concerns, so in Colorado, we are in non-attainment for ozone. So we are very curious to know if the development is going to be in the non-attainment ozone area, uh, what BMPs CDPHE would like to see in place. Next slide, please. One of the tools that CDPHE uses is a tool called EnviroScreen, 
which compiles a lot of different data about health burdens, environmental burdens, risk factors, to show what's happening in a community that might be um, more impacted than other communities and where we might want to think differently about how we approve things or if we approve something near that community. And in general, um, a score above 85, so EnviroScreen has a 100 score of 100, um, triggers a, a more in-depth look at what's happening with that community and whether or not we might want to require something additional to be more protective in that community. Next slide, please, sorry. Uh, we also consult with the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Department. So um, we have identified areas of the state where there are sensitive habitat um, areas. And sometimes that consultation will result in additional location, alternative location analysis, best management practices, or conditions of approval. I do wanna add that both CDPHE, a local government, or Parks and Wildlife can recommend denial to the commission if they feel that what the operator is putting on the table is not protective enough. Um, wildlife also can require direct or indirect compensation. So if an operator can show there really is no other location for them to access those minerals underground, CDP, sorry, uh, wildlife uh, might say, okay, so you, you can't drill while they're in winter concentration habitat. You have to drill outside that area and you're gonna to have to pay us because you're taking a chunk of habitat out of um, that wildlife's impact area. And then they use that funding to um, supply habitat protection in other areas of the state or maybe adjacent to the location being considered. Next slide, please. So another way that we, so those are kind of the rules and how we set up the rules to be protective and kind of reduce cumulative impacts. Then as we review each individual application from an oil and gas operator, which is called an OGDP, we require them to fill, um, provide data to us in, the for, ugh, in a form called the Form 2B. And that form um, then fills in what we call our Cumulative Impacts Data Evaluation Repository. And that's data we use on an annual basis to assess what's happening, where it's happening, and what those impacts look like. And the Form 2B provides information to the Commission, such as the number of wells and where the location is going to be, um, the emissions associated with constructing and then producing the oil and gas, what kinds of nuisance uh, impacts there might be to people around or wildlife, including noise, light, dust, and odor, um, how much water the operator is going to use for fracking, where that water comes from and then where that water ends up, whether or not they're in protected habitat, whether or not there's other uh, existing oil and gas locations within that area, and um, whether or not there's people near those locations. Next place, please. So this is an example of emissions data that an operator needs to submit as part of the Form 2B, so we can see the various kinds of uh, emissions from pre-production and production. Next slide, please. So the operator also has to turn in a cumulative impacts plan, which is a description of the impacts that they expect from their operation, how they're trying to first avoid those impacts, how they're gonna minimize those impacts, and how then as a last kind of of the tier, how they're gonna um, mitigate if necessary to offset the impacts that they will be introducing into an area. Next slide, please. So this is an example from uh, Noble, an oil and gas operator in Colorado. Um, in this example, sorry, I'm going to look this up so I have the details. Um, they submitted an application to us to drill 25 new wells on three different locations in Weld County, which sounds like a lot. But as part of this application, the operator also committed to plugging and reclaiming 16 le 60 legacy wells and decommissioning 16 legacy facilities, resulting in restored high priority habitat, fewer wells that are within 2,000 feet that exi exist today within 2,000 feet of building units and people's residences, and the elimination of emissions from older legacy facilities. And then those reduced emissions also get submitted to the commission as part of its CIDR database. 
Next slide, please. So then all that data that the operators fill in in the form 2Bs gets put into our CIDR database. And then we use that data to provide an annual cumulative impacts report for the commission so that we can see cumulatively across the state, what is the impact of oil and gas development? And I've um, picked just a few examples from the report. It's many, many, many pages long and looks at everything from water usage, air emissions, habitat, um, number of wells drilled, number of wells plugged, whether or not you're in disproportionately impacted communities. So it's a, it's a pretty hefty report. So I'm just pulling a couple of examples from that report to show you. Next slide, please. So uh, this is a picture of last year, 2023, oil and gas locations um, within disproportionately impacted communities. Those are in red and those that are outside of disproportionately impacted communities that we approved are in blue. So um, what's important is not just whether or not we're developing in a disproportionately impacted community, but are you close to people? So for example, last year, um, sorry, I gotta look at my notes. I wanna make sure I have this right. Of the 71 locations that we approved last year, uh, 13 or 18% were approved within a disproportionately impacted community. You can see three were on the West Slope, 10 are on the Front Range. That's that little corridor that you see heading down the middle of Colorado. And of those 13 locations, 10 have no residential building units within 2000 feet. So an entire, on the Western Slope, for example, an entire county might be um, defined as a disproportionately impacted community, depending on what's happening in there. But the oil and gas development itself might not be near any people actually. So we want to keep track also of if it's in disproportionately impacted community, but is it also near people? And in this case, of the 13 locations, 10 do not have any residential building units within 2,000 feet. Uh, three of the locations are within 2,000 feet in an RBU. Two of those three had uh, obtained informed consent and the other location demonstrated substantially equivalent protections. Next slide, please. Uh, the next two slides are examples of high priority disturbance areas per well. So if you look at what the disturbance is on a construction basis by basin or area of the state, you can see that it's much higher on the Eastern Plains. And on the Eastern Plains, even though these are only individual vertical wells, their pad and impact is much larger because they're in very large, vast rural areas. And they're having to build roads to, to access the pad and then get the product out and they're having to truck the product out. So their footprint is much bigger than what you might see on the front range, for example, where they're drilling many wells, but on a smaller pad and already there's access to that um, mineral source. Next slide, please. So then we also use that information to look at what happens after the pad is built. It's called interim reclamation. They have to make that pad as small as they can and restore everything. And you can still see that the biggest impact, for example, is on the Eastern Plains. So as a commission, we might think, how can we work on the impacts on the Eastern Plains to make those pads smaller? Next slide, please. I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna start talking fast. I apologize. This is an example of NOx production per well during pre-production based on area, and you can see um, different wells in different places and how much the impact is on emissions. And that might be related to the depth of the well, the type of well, how long the vertical is, et cetera. Next slide, please. But when we also look at what's happening with all those wells across all those impact areas, NOx emissions are mostly coming from non-road internal combustion engines. So that's something that the commission has been focusing on. How do we reduce emissions from the drill rigs, for example, do we require them to go electric? Do we require a different type of engine? Do we require battery assist, et cetera, et cetera? Next, next slide, please. So we are heading into uh, our next iteration of cumulative impacts per the legislature and per the commission. We said, we know we have more work to do. We actually started uh, last year with four listening sessions. Um, had public comment sessions, did five community meetings, an online community meeting, uh, invited informational written dockets, and public uh, input. Next slide, please. Sorry, I only have a one minute left. These are the themes that we heard from those hearings. Next slide. People really want us to um, look at the impacts to um, 
define cumulative impacts, figure out baseline, and figure out if there's a threshold where the commission should either be saying no or requiring more than we're requiring now. Next slide, please. While we already have a, a definition for disproportionately impacted community in state statute, the feedback from folks is we want to use that Enviro screen as a tool more often. We want to make sure there's a threshold for disproportionately impacted communities. Um, whether it's denying or requiring something more. Next slide, please. I think I'm almost done. Um, they want more in community engagement. They want to be involved earlier in our process and have more say in where things happen and how they happen. They want information more directly, not indirectly through the newspaper or having to go online and find it from us. And they want to be more engaged with us, not just when there's going to be oil and gas development in their community. Next slide, please. Sorry. A uh, big part of it was how do we get information from you? Where is it? Is it easy to get? And is it in the language that we understand? Next slide, please. Um, this is what we're doing moving forward and the time frame for it. And that's my last slide. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, and you may have the opportunity, we don't have to take your content off quite yet. Um, you may have the opportunity to expand depending, just depending on how many questions we get from, from our audience. So thanks for those a lot to cover. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I was a little so overly we, ambitious perhaps. No, no, no. And if, um, so I'll go through the, the comments and questions that we have that relate to your presentation. Um, and if there's a, if there's a slide that you want, if we have time, if there's a slide or two that you want to go back to that you'd like to expand on, um, I'll let you know. So we have a question. Um, I'll go in order here. So how are those impacts like air emissions or water usage verified after the wells are in place? That's a really great question. So um, our commission is forward thinking. What will happen when you do this thing? And then we have other sister agencies who say, you're doing this thing. What 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 are you actually doing? So um, actual air emissions are submitted to the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. And we are trying to align our CIDR database with their database, which is called OnGare, and compare what operators are estimating to what then what they're actually submitting to um, the Air Pollution Control Division. Uh, the other was water. So after they start drilling, they have to turn in actual water usage to us um, after they figure out what they actually used. Thank you. Another question is, are the mitigating well plugs slash closures enforceable via the permit? And there's a second piece to this, which is how do you ensure there's follow through on that? I'm not sure I understand the question. So we heard that question from Danny. Um, and I'm not sure how to pronounce your last name, Danny. I'm sorry. If you could clarify, maybe chat a clarification. And while you're doing that, we'll get to the next question. Um, Commissioner, can you confirm that when Colorado is assessing cumulative impacts, it's referring to cumulative impacts from environmental stressors only? Is there a requirement to look at socioeconomic assessments too, or will there be? So that's another great question. I think that that is one of the biggest um, discussions and tensions as part of our cumulative impacts rulemaking 2.0. I think that the struggle for us as a commission has been, we only regulate and control oil and gas development. We don't regulate and control other things that I think folks would like to see us think about as impacts. So as we've been having the discussion about the definition of cumulative impacts, where the discussion is heading is asking an oil and gas operator to look at everything that exists yet to be defined what that area looks like, right? So what, what things exist in this community? Are there highway corridors? Is there a big dairy farm? Is there other oil and gas development? And when you add this additional thing, then what does that mean for that community? I would say that the other important piece is the Enviro screen tool from CDPHE which looks at a myriad of things, socioeconomic data, health impact data, um, emissions data, environmental. So that stuff is all embedded into the Enviro screen and the Enviro screen score. And we as a commission are trying, trying to use that data in a more meaningful way to make decisions about where development is happening and its impact on a community. So we have somebody who was commenting on a particular slide, the one that was showing the reduced numbers of um, the, the wells. 
Sal, is this reduction attributable to the cumulative impacts policies or did other market forces contribute to the cause of reduction? Yes. Uh, yes and yes. Um, so you're going to see a big dip during COVID because no one was doing anything during COVID. Um, but I think you see that continual downward trend is that what I would call an encouraging ratcheting on industry to be more thoughtful about how they're developing. So uh, what might be changing also is how many wells and operators trying to fit on one pad. They're developing better technology about the laterals that they can do so they don't require as many. They can do it from one pad instead of two or three. Um, and a lot of that is being pushed by us to say, you, you can't be near these houses. So you got to figure some, if you want that mineral, you can't be near this community. So they're figuring out through via technology, how to access those minerals with better technology. So I think it's a combination of both being driven by our rules, but there definitely have been some market factors as well. Right now the market's humming. So um, I would say hopefully that our rules are still, still ratcheting down and requiring quality applications, even though the market's doing well. Hmm. Okay, thank you. How did the legislature define disproportionately impacted communities? I knew I was gonna get asked that and I didn't <laughs> write it down, but it, it is based on um, uh, socioeconomic status, number of households below or above a certain poverty level, um, English, as a, English as a first language, um, and it, it is in our, I will find it and I will send it to you all so you can post it. I, my apologies, I knew I was gonna get asked that and I should have written it down. <laughs> No, that sounds good. There will be some follow-up communication or at least online. Uh, what are your community engagement tactics and have you received any feedback on that? So I think there's two pieces to that. So as part of our original rulemaking, if you're in a disproportionately impacted community or you're going to be near people, there's required engagement from the operator to have a community meeting at a time and location that's convenient for a community and um, offering childcare, for example, and it has to have information that, so that folks understand when, where, why, how this is all going to happen. And then the operator during our assessment has to explain what happened at the community meeting, what things were asked for by community and whether or not they're addressing those things. I think there's a, a second piece, which is how are we as a commission doing, for example, when we go through rulemaking, Acts at assess, accessing community and getting meaningful engagement from them and feedback. There's a lot going on in Colorado, and I think there's a little bit of fatigue from community where we keep asking the same kind of community members for similar information about what's happening in your community. What do you want us to do? So we're trying a lot harder to go out to community, asking them when is convenient for you. We've done a lot of online things now. We're trying very hard to provide a lot more in different languages, make it clear how you can participate in our process. We don't require then for people to have, we used to require a lawyer to participate because we're semi-adjudicatory. You can just participate as an individual now and share your ideas with us. So I think we're a work in progress, I would say, um, and learning a lot as, as we move forward as part of our community engagement. Mm -hmm. That's interesting to hear you say that a lawyer used to have to be present. I haven't heard that before. Did folks share examples or ideas of other times or ways that they would want to engage with the department? So kind of along the same thread, I think. Yeah, yes, yes. And we're and we're trying to trying to um, accommodate and address. Okay. Is there anything else you'd add? Mm, I think, you know, I. The more touches, the better and trying to develop relationships. So, I mean, I am a full-time commissioner, so I have, I guess I'll use the word luxury of going out to community and visiting and talking and sometimes just, just about listening because you're trying to build trust, even mm -hmm. when you have to say no. I think the other barrier is um, if you're a regular community member, you do not understand how rulemaking works and the rules of rulemaking. Um, and it's really important to work with community and explain why certain things are done in the way that they're done, which do not feel very friendly to the average person, any average person. Yeah, it's complicated. It's very technical. 
Um, a couple, we have a few more here. So if it's determined that a well is not near RBUs, is it possible that RBUs may develop near the wells in the future? Yes, and that and yes, that has happened. And that's where the local government um, consultation is super important. And I would say, as a rule, the commission has been trying very hard not to move in where communities currently exist, but then also discuss with local governments if we put this thing, some local governments have said, we want you to build it now and sooner than later, because we plan on building around your, this oil and gas location and wanting to give people who are thinking about buying a home, an understanding of what will happen in their community. A lot of folks feel like the local government or the realtor is, is um, it's not transparent enough to understand. I moved here and I thought this was gonna be open space in my backyard. And that actually was a proposed oil and gas development location and they didn't know about it. So it's, it's um, yes, the answer is yes. Okay. There was a set, there was a second question from this person but I think you've addressed it. I'll say it anyway, is potential future residential development taken into account in decision-making? Is there anything that you would add that you haven't already said? Yeah. I think we have to depend on the local government for that, but there are no rules about, we call that the reverse setback. So again, we're forward thinking what's what's within 2000 feet today as it exists and who you're going to impact. We have to depend on the local government to make decisions about how close they will allow a development near an oil and gas location after it has been built. Mm -hmm. The next one, I think, if I'm not wrong, is a clarification on the question that uh, was not um, that we didn't really answer. So um, this person says, in one of the example applications, you mentioned that the applicant was proposing to plug some wells. How does the commission ensure that those wells are actually plugged once the permit is uh, issued? We track all plugged wells, and they have to identify. They have API numbers, and they have to identify the num the. It's an identifier. It's like where it is and uh, who owns it. And they have to identify those as part of their application. And then we track and make sure that they were plugged. Thank you. Are disadvantaged communities involved in defining the parameters that are set by the state to address concerns that are uh, near or within their communities? So I guess that's a two-part question. One is the legislature has kind of guided us on how we define it and what factors we look at. and. Um, how to um, how to work with community. And then the second piece I think is on us to have meaningful community engagement and ask, how do you, how, how, how would it work for you to engage in our process? How do we make it easier and more transparent? And the biggest thing that we heard in our last iteration of community visits was we feel like by the time we learn about it, decisions have kind of already been made and we want we want to have influence more at the beginning of that process. And we're trying to figure out how to how to make that happen. And in particular, oil and gas activity, some of it is confidential business information that can't be shared, we can't access because it's protected, for example, and people's mineral rights are at play. So we're trying to figure out how we can try to honor that and have community be involved toward the beginning of planning for an operator and for local government. Um, and that is that again is a work in progress for us. Mm -hmm. okay. I think we have time for one more question. So I'm going to take the next one that I see, not because it's more important, but because it just rolled in first. Um, and that does not mean that we that the folks who continue to drop questions into the chat will not get an answer. Um, I believe so. And I, I'm looking for some sort of nod from the MPCA team that any unanswered questions can be communicated via the website or some other means. Yes, Hassan is saying yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so last question, Commissioner. You mentioned that there can be fees for habitat restoration in some cases. Have there been examples of fees or some sort of restitution for negative impacts to people or communities? We have not done that for people. And it, it feels different to do that for people than it does for um, animals. I think we look more toward what things can the operator do to benefit community versus kind of dollar amounts. We haven't we haven't broached that conversation before. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation, for the answers to everybody's questions. Um, I really appreciate the expertise and in in you sharing. 
your experience. Thanks for having me. And so with that, here's what we're going to do. We're going to roll into um, our next presentation. I'll introduce our next speaker and we'll follow the same protocol. Uh, if you've had if people in the audience, when, when questions occur to you, uh, you don't have to wait until the Q&A. You can pop them into the chat as they occur to you and we are capturing them. Um, and then after, the, after this second round, we're going to loop back to Maggie from MPCA with a few more comments. So, um, with that, uh, with that, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Sandra Whitehead. She is an associate professor of sustainable urban planning at George Washington University. Dr. Whitehead is the current president of the Society of Practitioners of Health Impact Assessment and the co-chair of the US EPA's National Environmental Justice Advisory Council's Cumulative Impact Work. <clears throat> She's a recognized expert of HIA, health in all and health in all policies and is the author of a recent paper which discusses the use of mixed methods for cumulative impact assessment, which has been accepted by the Journal of Environmental Justice. And she is gonna to speak to us about what we can learn from health impact assessment. So I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Wade. Thank you, Anna, <clears throat> pardon me. Thank you all for having me today and allowing me to um, share some things about HIA and about how um, our work on the, uh, the cumulative impact work group for the NEJAC has been informing EPA's approach. Next slide, please. So the SOFIA is actually the community of health in all policies practitioners, which um, HIA is one tool of health in all policies. So thinking about how do we talk about health in other sectors? I'm an urban planner, so a lot of my work has been around um, looking at the health impacts of, built, of the built environment and built environment policies and practices. Next slide, please. So this is the process model that the EPA is currently using for cumulative impact assessment, right? It's big and it's, there's these little tiny boxes and there's all of this detail in here. But what's important about this slide is not all of that detail, but the fact that they have decided, the EPA has, that cumulative impact assessment is really HIA 2.1. And they have built their model of, of current model on the um, sort of the chassis, if you will, of health impact assessment. What they're calling initiation is um, sort of the, the screening, and um, then scoping is much bigger, assessment, monitoring, um, I'm sorry, uh, recommendations and, and reporting and monitoring. These are all the phases of HIA. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about HIA and then um, I will I'll talk about how it applies to CIA. Next slide, please. So one of the things that, that reasons that EPA has wanted to work on this is, and we're working specifically in the permitting space on our NEJAC work. So permitting is, is fragmented. You know, we don't look at uh, permits holistically. Whenever someone is applying for an air pollution permit or a gas and oil permit, we don't say, oh, well, you know, Office of Air, Office of Water, Office of, of you know, Brownfields, you guys all come together and we're going to talk about across media. What are all the impacts across media? It's very hard to get down to these health impacts if you're not looking across media, but regulatory programs are not structured that way, nor is permitting. So we wind up with this sort of mosaic of decisions that impact people's health. And it's really hard to take those all into account. One of the questions the commissioner was asked was about, um, you know, how do you monitor this and are you looking at socioeconomic factors? The EPA wishes to look at communities holistically and not just be reliant on the technical aspects of permit review or risk assessment, but and not just looking at existing and differential disparities, but to look at the full social determinants of health. And agencies really have um, a hard time, and, and I'm sure that you all in Minnesota are familiar with this. It's really hard to meet people where they are, communities where they are, not have them you know, go to 53 meetings, whatever you're doing these, but also to not ask them to repeat their trauma, to keep talking about the same impacts, to keep, it's exhausting to ask them to come to 50 meetings. 
So we want to um, use these tools, not just to assess impacts, right? Which a lot of people with health impact assessment will do. Well, we assessed it. We don't have any more money to do anything about it. But, but this context is not just about assessing, but also addressing and to um, look at health and equity outcomes overall. Next slide, please. So there's a lot of different tools in a regulatory context that we um, health, prof health professionals use to um, sort of look at the outcomes, right? We have these mapping tools, which, which Commissioner talked about Colorado's is really good. Um, New Jersey has their own, Cal Enviro Screen, New Mexico is de has developed theirs. So different states have their own, in addition to EJ Screen, which is what the EPA uses. There are health matrices for decisions. Dr. Paul Mohai has done, from University of Michigan has done a lot of work on using these in the regulatory context. And then these sort of um, other tools that are a subset of health and all policies. Health notes analysis, which you may have seen um, in the context of uh, legislation. What are the health impacts of legislation that hasn't been adopted yet? HIA, which I'll talk about and um, CIA, which we'll talk about. Next slide, please. So why would you want to use HIA as a framework? It is an assessment tool that's in wide use, not just in the United States. It's a much younger practice in the United States. We've only been doing this since 1999, but in Europe and Australia, these are standard tools that are used every day to um, look at planning and policy decisions. Um, it's well established there's a set of minimum elements and practice standards that defines what an HIA is, how you do it, what the outcome should be, what is the process, and what it is not. Um, it's scalable. HIA can be um, sort of a mini scoping area, can be a rapid where you're doing an assessment sitting at your desk with data that's readily available on the internet. It can be a shorter community process where you're engaging the community um, less and looking at fewer impacts. It can be a six month process, which is an intermediate, or it can be a comprehensive if you're depending on what your time frames are, right? So it really is scalable and, and adaptable within these practice standards. Um, <clears throat> and it centers communities and community voice in decision making. And I'll show you in a minute. Um, how communities are consulted throughout the process. Next slide, please. So these are the phases of HIA, which I alluded to, which the EPA has adapted. Um, screening and HIA is really looking at, is it feasible? Do you have time to do the HIA before the decision is made? Do you have the right staffing uh, levels? Do you have the resources? Do you, right? Like it's so sort of the go, no go. Is everything set to be able to do an HIA? And scoping, which I'm going to focus on a bit in this presentation, scoping is really where you're setting your HIA up for success. You're defining the parameters of it, both um, how you're going to engage people, what are the decisions that need to be uh, taken into account, what are the proximate health impacts you're going to look at? And what's your methodology for doing that? Assessment is where you're applying your methodology and assessing the and predicting the impacts. Reporting is where you're sharing your findings that you've already um, come to with your community and co-created. And then your um, evaluation and monitoring phases, phases, your evaluation is looking at the minimum elements and comparing your process evaluation and looking at your outcomes. And then monitoring is the plan for over time to see if the impacts that you predicted have come true and you need to do another intervention besides the recommendations to avoid the, and mitigate. Um, you know, the commissioner talked about avoiding and mitigating. HIA has the same basis. Next slide, please. So thinking about, you know, as you're, if you're thinking about if, if HIA is the right framework for you, right, thinking about what the values that guide practice are, 
right? Democracy, making sure that people who are impacted by decisions are partic full participants in those decisions and not just told about it after the fact or ask for their involvement, which the EPA has been famous for doing, right? Um, and telling people what the decision is. Equity, making sure that you're addressing equity um, of the, the four different types of equity, the distribution um, and uh, process equity, making sure that people feel um, included. Sustainable development, making sure that what your um, recommendations are are sustainable and take care of the needs of the present and the future. Next slide, please. Making sure you're adhering to transparent and systematic processes and scientific practice so that you're using the best available data. And when I say data in HIA, I'm not just talking about risk assessment as we think of risk assessment as, as health scientists, but risk assessment from the community's perspective. What are the historical and cumulative factors that have made this community um, suffer from disproportionate health impacts or disproportionate environmental impacts? What are um, the processes for gathering community science and community narrative and putting those into your assessment process with your risk assessment, your traditional risk assessment? And then making sure that you're taking a comprehensive and holistic approach to um, public health and you're not just looking at physical factors. Next slide, please. So as I said, I mentioned HIA has this really great minimum elements and practice standards. And I'm not just saying that because I'm one of the co-authors, but this is uh, put out by Sophia and it's updated every couple of years. And I just wanted you to, to know that this exists and to give you a couple of examples of how thorough the standards are and the guidance for it. Next slide, please. So the great thing about HIA is that you are consulting with your community. Unless you're doing a desktop, you're going through your screening process, and then you're, you're looking at your scoping and you're saying, okay, community members, here's what we're thinking. Here's what the data says are the predicted health impacts. Here's what the, the historical records and the redlining records say are the environmental impacts that are um, structural in nature or the result of redlining. And what do you think? Are these real? Are these the important issues to you? And how, what are the issues we should be addressing in this process? And sometimes what the community tells you is not necessarily what you would look at um, from a health perspective, but it's important to listen to them and to take that into account because their reality is evidence. In the assessment phase, you're looking at the impacts and your, your help the community is helping you prioritize which impacts and which trade-offs because you're also in assessment, you're developing recommendations to mitigate the negative impacts and to emphasize the any positive impacts. How do we magnify beneficial impacts while also mitigating you know, historical factors and um, the, the negative impacts that might result from this decision? And in reporting, this is capturing what the community said as well as the data and the information and reporting that back. So you're working co-create that with your community and then they are also evaluating you. They are participating in the monitoring plan. The monitoring plan should include community members and community organizations that have been your partners. You know, oftentimes we were doing these HIAs from the health department or the regulatory um, perspective. And whenever we got to monitoring, there were other agencies that controlled, say, you know, obesity or, you know, other things that we felt needed to be monitored. So we brought them in as partners. And then this was published on a website so that the community had an accountability, um, a way of holding um, us accountable. Next slide, please. So some of the questions that come up, right, one of the things regulators are often worried about in community engagement considerations, I know I was, um, is what happens when the community doesn't want this? In our work um, on the NEJAC with the CPA process, one of the things that's come up is communities have told us, well, we don't want to participate in another assessment. We don't want to come and, and you know go to 55 meetings if there's no possibility that we 
can say no. We can have some influence over the regulatory um, decision. And this did happen in Chicago. Uh, the Chicago Department of Health did a cumulative impact assessment on the relocation of a recycling plant. And the community um, weighed in. They had a really inclusive process. And the decision was no, that they did, were not going to allow it. Now, of course, the, the, the recycler appealed and there was a settlement, but the community approved that settlement and those conditions, right? It was a co-creation. So I know it's painful when the community says no, but there are ways to, to manage that and to manage expectations when the community is a part of the process. Another issue that comes up is who represents the community, who gets to a seat at the table, who gets to weigh in, right? Who are the authentic people in the community and what does representation mean, right? These are things that you have to think about, right? Is it just people who live in this neighborhood? Is it people who are a mile away? Is it people who are in the um, airshed? right? Who is the community and who gets to stay? Who, who gets a say? And then weighing community input versus other types of hard data, the way that we think of data, right? As regulators, we think, oh, well, you know, we have to defend this in court. And one of the things the people in, in the water program in Florida, where I used to work, told me was, well, you just talk to people. That's not evidence, right? I can't use that in court the way I can a water sample from the state lab that says, you know, this water is not drinkable. If someone sues us, I can't say, well, you know, Sandra talked to Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Jones said the water's still undrinkable. But we have to have some way of navigating that, some process that says whenever the water is clearly undrinkable or smells bad or has other issues, how do we bring that perspective into our regulatory decision? And then when to stop engaging with the community, if ever. I, I think we need to have these ongoing relationships, but you know, I'm not working at the statewide level anymore. It's easy for me to say, oh, we should you know, invest time in every single community in your state. Next slide, please. I talked about the scalability of, of HIAs, and this just gives you uh, sort of an overview of the different levels of HIA and the different um, resource levels that you would need. Next slide, please. So HIAs do not only consider exposures and risk. They look at a broad set, broader set of socioeconomic, mental health, and physical health um, outcomes. They also um, look at historical harms from previous policies, legacy communities, um, primarily is where this has been done. I'm thinking Chicago and Philadelphia have um, both had good success with this, um, Baltimore to a lesser extent. And then defining thresholds for adverse impacts and what constitutes no impact. You know, as you're thinking about, you know, what's a, signif a significant finding for, for your work, um, consider co-creating those uh, with a community and really workshopping them hard, not just with your, your co-regulators at the local level, but also across offices and media at the, um, at the Minnesota Department of um, at Health and um, in your agency as well. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that a rapid is more like an extended scoping phase. And Chicago, the significant thing about this I wanted to bring up is that Chicago, instead of asking people to come to 50 meetings and relive their trauma, they looked at past complaints in this neighborhood. They looked at um, not just complaints, they looked at regulatory decisions, they looked at um, caps that had uh, been put in place on these agencies, and they used that as data. So I'm, I'm getting the high sign, I have one minute left. Next slide, please. So scoping to me, I want to spend my last minute on scoping. Scoping is the most important phase because you're establishing what is your legal authority to do this uh, process? What are your resources and timeline? What's the decision history? Has this been a community that's been disproportionately impacted multiple times by decisions of MCPA, right? 
um, what are the baseline and uh, conditions and um, the prioritization level, right? But really thinking about your roles and responsibilities, who needs to be on your team, not just from the staff perspective, but from the community partnership perspective. Um, taking some time to do some root cause analysis through literature review and vulnerability analysis, which I know you already do as part of your process. And then creating those pathway diagrams that demonstrate very easily pictorially what the impacts are, right? Here's the decision. I mean, here's the policy, here's the decision parameters, and here are the health endpoints. And this is also when you create your community engagement plan. You decide who to engage with, at what stage of the process, and how often, whether you're consulting them, whether you're informing them, and whether you're co-creating with them. And I see that I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop. Thank you, Sandra. So far, I only see one question coming in. And so we, uh, we may have time for um, either or both of our speakers to expand on any additional content if that is the case. So I'll read this one off. Um, so first of all, this person says, thank you for providing the Chicago recycling, <clears throat> the example of the, the Chicago recycling facility. Do you have any uh, specific examples of permitting or regulatory projects where an HIA has impacted or influenced the permit requirements where the project still went through? I see that you're on mute. Um, yes, and I guess it's not what you would probably think of as a regulatory um, decision, but zoning is regulatory, and there have been numerous examples where um, HIAs have influenced uh, the conditions of rezoning and the uh, sort of the community benefits, benefits package that came with new industry. And one of the specific examples I'm, I'm thinking of was in uh, Tampa, Florida, where the HIA was able to um, really leverage some additional community funding from a redevelopment that was coming in along, along the riverfront, the river walk in Tampa. And um, the community that was right next to it called uh, Hyde Park was going to be impacted as a historically African-American neighborhood that had been disinvested. And they were able to get not just a, a fund for um, some affordable housing uh, created, but also some community training and redevelopment funding for the community. So the redevelop the, the approval went through, but the community got compensated in a way. Now, one of the problems I have with community benefits packages with in regulatory decisions is that sometimes it feels like it gives polluters, especially, permission to sacrifice the people in that area because they built a school or they, you know, built this or they did that for the community when in fact, you know, people are still being exposed. So I was trying to think of a more a regulatory one. I think there is one in New Jersey where there was a cumulative impact assessment that was done um, and it was done from their desk and it informed the permit and the permit went, the community protested and then the permit went through anyway, but the community did get some benefits out of it. But again, you know, that's in a perfect world, it would be more of a participatory process and not a desk-based. Um, I believe that this one was done by Dr. Ayers in New Jersey, and he literally looked at the GIS mapping tools and made that determination. Thank you. And we have a, uh, the question, a couple of questions from the commissioner. Uh, where is the line between NIMBY versus community voice and saying no? Yeah, I think that's that's really the hard part, right? That was kind of what I was getting at at the when do you stop engaging, right? Mm. When is it when does it become unproductive or you know look like it's going to head to court? Because that is where this, you know, a lot of times these wind up because this is a new process, this is a new way of thinking about it. These are new laws across all of these states. I think Minnesota, you guys were first. 
um, out of the box with the state law. And so in a lot of ways, we're, we're still trying to figure that out. But from my, my land use planning background, I can say that there are um, professional NIMBYs, right? There are people who are, who come to these and they're well-read and they're well-researched, but, you know, they come to every one. And the, the best thing you can do, I think, if you have time and staff to do it, is to try to figure out who these people are going to be and to pull them into the process early and often and get their voice so that they have an ownership and they're not going to torpedo you at the end. But that's, you know, easy for me to say. I don't have those resources right, as a researcher. There's a second part to her question, which is, is it the relationship to community impacts that is key? Can you speak to that at all? I think it's the, the relationship to health impacts, right? Because you can talk about environmental factors and you can talk about, you know, financial factors and, and you know, certainly those are important. But the thing that really gets people to the table and gets people, right, it hits them in here is whenever you start talking about their health. And, you know, they, it really speaks to them when you say, well, you know, um, whenever the pollution went down, right, people during the pandemic, for instance, whenever air pollution was better, right, we had people started walking outside and, you know, all of these things seemed better for a while health endpoints. And I think though, I'm sorry, I forgot where I was going with that, but basically talking about health and pulling people in based on their health and health outcomes, I think is going to sort of neutralize some of the animosity. Thank you. Have impacts of climate change been explored as part of HIAs or or Colorado planning. So I'm not sure if this is a question for Dr. Whitehead. Can you speak to that at all? And I can, can there's been a few um, health impacts assessments on climate change. There was a really big one in the UK, which was quite comprehensive. There have been a couple that looked at different aspects of, of climate here in the US. There was one done in California. There's been one done in Maryland, but I haven't seen a ton of them. Commissioner, you want to talk about how Colorado accounts for? Yeah, so not based on the health impact assessment, but Colorado has greenhouse gas climate goals. And so um, the, our version of the Air Pollution Control Division for Colorado um, takes the, go the goal that was set by the legislature, uh, a reduction based on a baseline year, and then apportions out based on industry and who's emitting greenhouse gases, for example, and how much has to be reduced by uh, those industry pieces. And we try to connect to that. And as part of, so for example, as part of our next cumulative impacts rulemaking, one of the two, two, two bars that you have to jump over in order to even submit an application will be, are you in compliance with your greenhouse gas targets set by our sister agency? And are you in compliance with your NOx targets set by our sister agency? And if you're not, we're going to ask you why we would allow you to emit more if you're not meeting your current targets. Because we have some time still, um, I'm going to go back up to the questions that we didn't get to earlier, if that, um, so that we'll put you back on the spot, Commissioner. Um, how do you intend to make sure that the rules are enforced for a better impact? And you're muted, I'm sorry. Sorry, I pushed the wrong button and I couldn't see the screen at all. Zoom and I do not get along for whatever reason, for however long we've been using it. It's like my <laughs> emesis. Um, sorry, could you say the question again? Yeah. Yes, how do you intend to make sure that the rules are enforced for a better well, impact? So we have a um, so the once we approve an oil and gas development plan, it then becomes part of the permit and it's all enforceable. So our inspectors who go out and inspect the sites um, can enforce against that. So if there's conditions of approval, best management practices, or just something that the operator um, 
uh, said that they would do, that's all enforceable as part of the permit and our compliance, um, our compliance arm then is able to um, inspect and enforce against that. I'm going to go ahead and ask the second one that was that's for you, Commissioner, and then I'm going to loop back to you, Sandra. The questions are coming in. And I'm trying to field who the, who they go to. So this question came from Mary, and I think she chatted this when you were going through the presentation. She says, "Why 2,000?" Does in you, you're not in your head. You know what that is referring to? Yeah. So the 2,000 okay. foot setback is based on a health risk assessment that was. Um, not it was contracted out by CDPHG, and that was the best data that we had at the time. And so um, we used that 2,000 foot setback and that health risk data to try to form a pretty hard setback from residential building units, schools, and high occupancy buildings. Mm -hmm. And another one for you, Commissioner, does Colorado's climate goals and plans include economic development that in, that includes alternatives to oil, gas, and mineral extraction, which impact climate and health in your state and globally? Yes. So there's a greenhouse gas roadmap set for the state that includes um, goals for alternative energy sources to try to offset. Um, I mean, the, the thing about oil and gas, right, is we, we don't get to control where it exists. And so even though Colorado as a state is trying to get to a a goal of 100% renewables by X date, we we still supply not just our own state's resources, we supply those resources to other states, other people, right? And so we're trying to ensure that whatever it is that we are extracting, we're extracting it in the most protective manner, that it's, we, we call it the cleanest molecule possible, um, <laughs> hydrocarbon molecule, and that it's a tagline that the industry likes to use um, but we feel like it's st we still need to play a part because not everybody maybe is in the same space that Colorado is. And we realize that we are a producer of an energy source that other folks are using. Hmm. I hope that answered the question. But if you you can find our greenhouse gas roadmap and you can see what the goals are for all the different uh, energy sources and how we're trying to get there. Great. Um, Sandra, a question for you. There was a timeline of the HIA process, but can you provide a general idea of how long the process takes? Is it months, years, and how much does that cost? So it depends on the scale. Um, a rapid, the, what, the kind that you can do from your desktop, that can take anywhere from a week to a, a few days, um, depending on if you can work on it full time. And then um, an intermediate is, you know, it can be a couple of months. Um, usually they're about three months. And honestly, the, the biggest cost is staff time. You know, a, a full comprehensive HIA takes about a year and costs, I don't know, the way that we were doing them um, most recently, we estimated that the year long one takes about $50,000. The, the intermediate, the one that's like three to six months, it was 15,000 or less. You know, we you, just depends on um, the level of staffing that you need and whether you have to travel, those kinds of, of issues. But um, it's not that expensive, right? People are always like, oh, it takes too long and it's super expensive. But a lot of the data that you need for these, a lot of the modeling you're doing as part of your other processes or um, a part of your agency owns that data. Right. The biggest part of the cost is the engagement and making sure that um, you're getting people to the table that need to be there and that you have enough time to really have the community help inform your process. But at some point, you have a regulatory deadline to make your decision. And that's what I was referring to whenever I was talking about at some point you have to stop you know, engaging and actually make your decision. And hopefully your decision is informed by the things you heard from the community. I mean, ultimately the agency has that responsibility, but also to make sure that you create that opportunity for an ongoing dialogue after the decision is made, because this isn't the last time that community is going to, to have a permit submitted, you know, for um, a facility there. Uh, this next question actually builds on that. Uh, so you mentioned in your presentation, Sandra, that the process is democratic. <clears throat> and so Allison is wondering, to what extent is this process democratic? 
if at some point regulators have the option to stop listening to the community. Can you speak to that? Yeah, and I guess stop listening is, is not what I intended to say. What I meant was at some point you have a regulatory deadline and to gather as much community input and, and to use that input in your decision and talk to the community along the way and say, this is what we heard from you. This is how we used that. You know, first, this is what we heard. Is that right? Right. Here's how we're thinking of using that. This is what I meant by community engagement along your process. Here's what we heard from you. Is this correct? Here's how we're thinking about using what we heard from you, your lived experience, your community data. Because remember, some communities have their own air monitoring um, facilities, right? They buy those little regulators or, you know, they do water monitoring. So communities gather data too. And making sure that you are bringing them along with you through your decision process so that whenever you get to that part where you're like, okay, we have two weeks to publish this decision. It has to go in the paper and, you know, do all of the things you have to do when you're publishing a permitting decision, but they should not be surprised by that. They should have known about it. They should have participated in it. And once that decision's made, you should be able to have a relationship with them such that after the fact, if the the facility isn't doing what it said, or you know they're they're experiencing health impacts, or they should have that open door back to you, right? It isn't that you may be able to mo to modify the permit because that's probably not possible, but listening to them and making sure that you know there are things you can do to address their concerns if they are ongoing. That's all I meant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But another question around climate change impacts, and I think this is for you, Commissioner. Are climate change impacts on air quality now and anticipated in the future that they're that are likely to increase increase background pollutants being considered as part of cumulative impacts? That's an interesting question. It probably better for the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, the keepers of all things air. Um, my focus mm -hmm. is so on oil and gas right now. But I think that um, when we, this, our state, when we've been setting goals, they typically have been picking a baseline year for which they know they have good data and then saying, we're gonna reduce by X percent from that baseline data by Y date. So cumulatively for that particular pollutant, you shouldn't see a baseline increase. We should see a, a slow decrease. Um, we have discovered in oil and gas, however, sometimes when we, decrease one pollutant and it increases another um, by de facto of what's happening. So like we had a VOC rulemaking a couple of years back, that's increased NOx actually. So now we're trying to talk, tackle NOx. So there's some interesting sometimes offsets when you do one thing that you didn't think about that was going to happen. And I'm not sure that answered that person's question, but my perspective now for several years has been basically oil and gas. I'm not sure I'm gonna do mm -hmm. justice to the, the total air quality perspective. Thank you. And so a uh, question came from Laura. Laura, if you have a follow-up to that, that is um, specifically around oil and gas, uh, feel free to type that in. A couple of questions for either or both of you to answer. Do either of you know of an existing or potential future clearinghouse for public engagement data and reports? Perhaps the, the uh, requester could clarify what they mean. I'm not okay. sure what they mean by data and reports. Is that, so I'll ask this next question. It seems, um, or I was gonna say it seems relevant or related, but no. Um, so that came from Sadie. Sadie, if you are able to clarify what you're looking for a little bit more specifically, that'd be helpful. And then while you're doing that, I'll ask the next, the next question. Do either of the presenters have best practices to share about how to make sure those involved from the public accurately reflect those most impacted by projects. So, and there's a second piece to this as you're thinking that's related. How do you respectfully know who quote represents the community and avoid unknowingly excluding people? I'll start and maybe Sandra wants to. Uh, so I, I think that's a really good question. And I think Sandra said before, sometimes you have folks who are consistently a part of your process and re represent community at large. So like green Latinos represent a certain segment of our stakeholder um, group that works with us all the time, but they don't necessarily represent a specific community. 
And I think we've been trying hard to work with an operator to say, you, you need to be in community. You need to put flyers on all the doors within an X or Y radius and invite them to a meeting so that what I will call the usual suspects don't just show up who are well-intentioned and well-meaning and have great ideas. But you really want to, to your point, to the questioner's point, you're really trying to get at the people who live in that community and what their feedback is. And I, I would say that's a really hard thing to achieve and as part of our rulemaking process, we've been trying to work through local nonprofits, schools, libraries, places where people are and have connections to figure out how we get a broader, wider um, representation of community to feed into our process. Yeah, I think Karen's right, right? Going to the institutions that are in the community that's that's going to be affected, um, one of the things that we always did was you know, do the door to door, sending out the letters, making sure that people knew that they were in the in the impacted area, but also going to trusted institutions and saying, here's the list of people we're talking to, or here are the people who've come to the meetings, who's missing, right? And sort of doing a snowball sample of who is not at this table that should be. Um, looking at your data and kind of slicing and dicing different segments of the community and making sure that all of those impacted or vulnerable are um, have some representation. And the only way really to know if the representation is real is just to talk to people in that community, right? And say, like I said, who's not here or, you know, Thank you, Mrs. So and so. I really appreciate that. You know, Bethel Baptist Church has been at all of these meetings, but perhaps you could give us the names of four of your church members who might be interested or or have something to uh, relate to us that's significant, right? Like being intentional about um, finding those connections, which you know, as Karen was saying, you need the people on the ground to be your um, help with that. Thank you. The one comment that I see left here, when I'm not cutting anybody off, we still have some time. So if anybody in the audience has additional questions, please keep bringing them in. But there's just one last comment here from um, Laura who had that the air quality question. She says, climate impacts like increased wildfire smoke or higher ozone levels from more extreme heat are what is meant by the climate change impacts. Thank you, Laura, Laura for clarifying. And I would say there that Colorado has been experienced. I mean, we can't control air doesn't have specific borders, right? And things come in from other states and other states have other policies that impact Colorado in addition to the fact that we're in a bowl and things settle along the front. And there are things that are beyond our control. And um, fortunately, we have a governor who's been just very supportive of we will address and tackle the things that Colorado can control. And then we have to hope that by setting examples and showing that things are successful, other states will follow suit. Um, and then we will not be impacting each other as much. I will also say that I think EPA has been paying better attention to things that happen in other areas of a country that impact different areas. And so hopefully that's also happening for Minnesota, but we've been impacted by wildfire, wildfires and EPA has been cognizant of that sometimes that's impacting um, an assessment or a baseline that we have for a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. Great. So at this time, um, oh, I see one more comment. Okay, I'll read this off. As an engagement facilitator for local government, I, want to, I wanted to make sure I wasn't asking the same question somebody else already asked, but found it very difficult to gain access to the results of previous engagement efforts from other departments, either because current staff weren't familiar with it or no one knew where it would have been saved. So we discussed setting up something internal, but I would love to find something more accessible. This is, um, thank you, Sadie. This was a clarification on that question about us clearing house. The, the best one that I have heard of is actually um, a docketing system. And the EPA Region 5, which is Chicago, has been setting this up. And what, what it looks like, and 
perhaps this is something you all be interested in, is every time someone in their office interacts with a community, they enter into this database, this docketing system, says, you know, I talked to Ms. Hall in uh, Cincinnati about the lead plant that exploded and her community's exposure. We did an investigation, da, 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 right? And every one of these interactions with communities or a uh, permit uh, comment or a complaint goes into this docketing system so that if I, as the community engagement person, got, you know, won the lottery and got a different job or, God forbid, something happened to me, the person who came behind me could pick that up and go, oh, yes, I need to call Mrs. Hall about that issue down in Cincinnati, right? I think something like that, what we had at the state of Florida was a complaint logging system, which to me is just the name of it was wrong, right? That's not exactly what it was, but being able um, to put in those positive community interactions and those um, sort of inquiries for of interest and, and people who are just asking for information. I mean, I think that that's really valuable and that might be something like a docketing system might be something you all are interested in setting up. Thank you. And thank you to everyone in the audience for asking the questions um, and clarifying when we need a clarification. I really appreciate your um, your participation. We have a few minutes left. So um, everyone here, if you have just a few minutes, I wanna loop back to Maggie uh, uh, at MPCA because she wants to clarify or um, explain, I guess, the process, the overall process that MPCA is following and where we sit in that process. So everybody has an idea of what's um, what this looks like at a higher level. Go ahead. And so Vanessa, okay. if I could, if you are able to bring up the slides from the, um, it is slide four and five, I wanna say we're going back to, thank you. Anna's being kind, I skipped this and she reminded me as we get started. Um, thank you all. So, so as I said, this was our third kind of co-learning webinar and really great questions from the audience and great questions from MPCA staff in the chat. Um, thank you so much to Sandra and Karen for sharing their expertise with us. Um, we anticipate having two more of these sessions in April and May. You may be getting a save the date for April later this week. We're working hard on it. Um, we anticipate that session being about community benefit agreements and how that has worked in some other related, related types of programs. Um, and then we're going to move into really digging in on what the law requires us to create and rule. And, and I know that people have been like, so ready to jump into that. And, and we're really excited to switch to that too. Um, we don't have dates to announce yet. We anticipate those sessions being sort of June through October. We're really um, working with DeYoung on both planning and facilitating those sessions so that we can hear from a lot of people, capture the good input and be able to really pull that into the, the formal rule language. Um, we, this is all in rule development um, to meet our 2026 deadline the legislature gave us to put the entire draft rule packet on public notice. And so everything we're talking about in 2024 is all, you know, important public engagement. We don't, but there's, you know, even after these webinars and then the working sessions, there's still kind of a long ways to go. Can we go forward one slide? Um, This is in the statute itself. And, and just a reminder, and this is sort of part of the topics we tried to pull for the webinar and it will guide the, the working sessions as well. The law told us this list of eight things that we need to create in the rule, seven things, depending on how you count. Um, but we really want your input on this. We got input in the fall during the request for comment. People have continued to share thoughts with us. We will have a lot more chances in the summer and fall but we know that we need to establish basically the parameters for each of those. So when do we have to do a cumulative impact analysis? What are the required contents? What is the public information that goes into that? Um, what would constitute a substantial adverse impact? So you heard about that today. What, when is there sort of no impact or functionally no impact and when is there an impact? Um, if there is an impact and we can't address it with the facility, what, what would a community benefit agreement look like? As Sandra said, there's, you know, a community benefit agreement is kind of an acknowledgement of unavoidable harm. How do we, how do we weight that? What's the procedure for entering that? Um, it re requires us to establish a petition process. 
Um, there's some specific process around tribal governments electing to participate in this that would happen through consultation. Um, consultation is formal government to government between the state of Minnesota and, and tribal government. Um, and then establishing methods for holding public meetings and handling public comments. And I think you heard a little bit about this from Sandra and Karen today of there's the engagement around the rule and that's where we are right now and that matters and that's statewide. But then there's also what are the minimum requirements going to be for a facility that really could focus on an individual neighborhood because obviously that would be in a specific place and proposing a specific project. Um, and so we're trying to learn and hear from you and do better engagement on the rule itself. And we need to formalize some of that, those conditions into the rule so that when projects come through this process in 2026 and beyond, they are doing adequate public engagement around individual facilities. Um, so, you know, we're kind of balancing those two pieces too and trying to make sure that what we hear during the rule is reflected in those conditions for projects. So, that's sort of where we're at. We will continue to share all of the opportunities, webinars and work sessions, everything through the Gov delivery list for sure. So if you're not on that, please go to the PCA website and sign up for updates on cumulative impacts. Um, that's the easiest way to make sure you get it. We'll try to do social, we'll try to do other things, but the, the Gov delivery list is the kind of sure thing. Um, and we will, we really appreciate all your time today and DeYoung and our speakers. Um, Anna, did I miss anything else? No, I don't think so. Is there any any final remarks um, from the PCA team or my team? I'll just add one thing on to what Maggie was saying. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Hassan Boucherab. I'm the engineer coordinating all of the technical aspects of this at the at the PCA for the rulemaking. Um, just wanted to to mention, circle back to one of those earlier questions or a few questions ago sort of surrounding um, engagement, talking with folks, uh, meeting people where they're at, right? You know, again, we're, we're, we're doing these. You're, you may be attending this because you're already signed up on that gov delivery list that uh, Maggie mentioned. Maybe you heard this from a friend, family member, coworker, or something like that. Um, you know, these are the wide, big opportunities, uh, but also just if if you are interested, you want to talk to us more, you want us to come talk to you more about something, whatever it is that you find interesting um, or want to hear more about for this rule, uh, let us know. Because uh, we, the last time we did one of these webinars, we got a request to come talk at a, a different meeting that was set up in, in um, Minneapolis or around that area. So. If you are interested, you're more than welcome. Send send me an email, give me a call, let me know, hey, I got this thing going on a couple of weeks from now. Would you or somebody be willing to come talk about this rule or this a uh, specific part of this rule that you might be interested in? Just let us know. That's and we'll 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 see what we can do to make it work. One final comment from Commissioner, and then we'll wrap up. Oh, thanks. Someone um message me to add this for my slide deck i just assume you guys are going to post it and it's accessible yes the recordings um on the website uh the that maggie posted in the chat there you can find uh previous recordings of these webinars on there as well so you'll be able to see the presentation and everything big thank you to our speakers uh, for being with us today it's much appreciated Take care, everyone. Have a great day.